Please take your copy of God's Word. Let's turn together to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, our text this morning actually is most of the chapter, uh, this familiar scene, Jesus and Lazarus and Martha and Mary, Jesus declaring he is the resurrection and the life. We'll be looking at verses 1 to 44, though our reading will be the center of the section verses 17 to 27. But as you're turning there, I just would mention uh, Sarah and I are heading back to Houston and to MD Anderson on Tuesday. And so Mike Malone will be preaching next Sunday and Sarah will be having her surgery on Monday the 25th. But be coming back, I'll be coming back on July the 31st. uh, And that Sunday will be beginning the first of seven Sundays in a, a series that I've been thinking about really since March. Uh, that I'm calling Resets, uh, the church culture that Jesus desires us to have. Uh, what, what is the kind of culture, the, the feel of, of our place together uh, as we move forward uh, into our future together? Um, it seems to me that there's an opportunity to, to do a kind of reset. Um, in September 2016, uh, IPC called me to be senior pastor, so it's been almost six years Uh, since the church called me. Uh, And in the same way that sometimes you have to do a reset on your phone, right, to hold those buttons together to get it to move forward, that's what I'm hoping we can do together over the seven weeks, starting July 31st and running through September 11th. And then after that, we'll come back to John's gospel uh, for the rest of the year. So that's upcoming. But this morning, we come to this very familiar scene in which Jesus has for us one of his I am statements, but also the the seventh miracle uh, or sign that shows forth his glory, shows forth who he is uh, as the Christ, the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. John desires us to have Martha's affirmation as our own, that I believe that Jesus, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But in order for that to happen for us, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask him for his help. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, we do ask you for your help. Indeed, Father, through the Son, we pray that you would send your Spirit, that our eyes of faith might be opened this morning, that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel. Above all, Lord, in the midst of our our sorrow and darkness and night, we pray that you would come and speak your word and be present in your present risenness, we ask. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, John chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So friends, we're we're so familiar with this passage. We hear it in nearly every funeral that we do here at IPC that I'm I'm afraid that we we need a little bit of a a shock, a little bit of of a reset so that we might understand what this passage and these words mean for us right now, today. And so here's a story that might help us. One that I was reminded of this week from Brennan Manning's book, Abba's Child. 
Manning tells this story about G.K. Chesterton, who was uh, a British journalist from the, uh, about 100 years ago. And the story goes that he was standing on a street corner, G.K. Chesterton was, and he was approached by a newspaper man. And the reporter says to him, Sir, I understand that you've recently become a Christian. May I ask you a question? Well, certainly, said Chesterton. And the reporter asks him, If the risen Christ suddenly appeared at this very moment and stood behind you, what would you do? And Chesterton looked the reporter squarely in the eye and said to him, well, he is. What in the world did Chesterton mean? What what in the world did he mean that, that he believed that Jesus is standing behind him? Having been raised from the dead, did he mean that Jesus was some kind of ghost or some kind of life force like in the recent Obi-Wan Kenobi, always present if you, if you just had eyes to see him? Or, or does he mean something more? Does that mean that when Jesus tells us here that he is the resurrection and the life, that Jesus is very person and presence with us, the same person and presence that was was with his disciples 2,000 years ago, that that Jesus' person and presence is with us, though a veil is separating us so that we cannot see him, that, that he actually is here. And if the Jesus of the Bible is actually really, truly standing behind us and beside us and in front of us, like St. Patrick said, and in fact dwelling within us by his spirit, as Paul said in Colossians 1, the very hope of glory, what does that mean for us? (laughs) What does that mean for us right now, today? Amid the chances and changes of our lives, what does it mean? What's the present value of Jesus saying to us, I am the resurrection and the life? It has to mean something, especially in view of all the losses that we know. I mean, our our lives are filled with loss. Some of you have known loss from your earliest memories. You can barely grasp hold of of your earliest days, remembering when when perhaps a parent died, when you were just an infant or an early toddler, or or perhaps a parent who abandoned you. And from that moment on, you've always known this sense of loss and, and the trauma of that loss. Others of you, it's just been in recent days, perhaps, that you've begun to accumulate losses and you've known some of the pain and the heartache that loss can bring but whether you've always known loss or it's only been a recent reality to you where it's really been in present to you the fact of the matter is is that our lives are are chained in decay because of this web of sin around us and and we know the reality of grief and loss and this passage has three of those losses that we, that we inevitably experience in this life. And, and in fact, John's description of them here, it's so realistic that, that as Mary and Martha and, and their friends and family and Jesus and, and his followers, as they experience these losses, we can feel them. We know exactly what this is like. It's as though we were sitting over a meal and someone was telling us their story of loss and we, in, in, in empathy, we, we know the reality of them. These losses like debility, illness, sickness, debility, that, that's how this passage opens. The very first words, which we didn't read together, but you see in your Bibles, John 11 verse 1, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And then in verse 3, the sister sent to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. And so the the overwhelming fact with which this passage begins is, is debility. Lazarus is ill. And at this point, we don't know for certain the extent of his illness, 
but we lead with this reality of the debility and illness and sickness. It, it creates a measure of loss. And in fact, because we don't know how ill Lazarus is, we're, we're thrown off a little bit by verse 4. It appears as though Jesus doesn't expect Lazarus to die. Verse 4, when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that God, the Son of God may be glorified through it. I actually think the NIV gets a little bit closer to what Jesus is trying to get out here. Namely, this illness does not end in death. In other words, death does not ultimately triumph. Already he's giving us a clue of what's going to happen. And of course, there is a sense that for every believer that's the case, right? Our illnesses, even our final illness, does not ultimately end in death because of the hope of the resurrection. But here, what is not yet clear is what's going to happen. Still, we, we know the reality that, that debility, illness, and, and sickness that, that's entered into Lazarus' life and, and ultimately into his sister's lives as well, Mary and Martha. This debility brings real loss, and you've known that. You've known the reality that, that sickness, illness, debility, it brings losses. Some of them are simple losses, at least relatively so. The doctors tell you, don't pick up anything heavy for a few weeks, nothing more than 10 pounds, or, or don't drive for two or four or six weeks, or be careful around uh, those who, whom you're around for, for 10 days or so. It would be really bad right now to pick up a virus. Those are simple losses, but, but friends, even the simplest losses, they're still losses. We still lose things when we can't pick things up or we can't, we can't get out of the house or, or we have to avoid certain people for a while because we don't want to get sick. Of course, many of the losses that we experience from debility, they're far more heartbreaking, far more life-changing. Like, it's time to give up your keys. It's time for you not to be driving anymore. Or it's staying bedridden, not for days, but for weeks and weeks, and you don't have the strength to get out of bed. Or you're unable to see loved ones, to feel their touch. You're in particular places in the hospital where they can't come. And all of these more significant, severe losses on top of feeling poorly, you just don't feel right. You're not thinking clearly, perhaps, or you're profoundly anxious and worried about what's next and what else will go wrong. We know the, the loss that debility can bring, that illness and sickness can bring, and, and often these losses from debility are met with a second loss of delay. We're in doctor's offices and clinics waiting and waiting to meet with those who might help us. We're on hold, yet again, talking to the insurance company, trying to get them to approve our procedure or our medicines, or we keep wondering when, if at all, our adult children will come to, to see us and to help us. We keep waiting for them. Friends, that, there's a certain kind of loss there too, isn't there? And we know this equation, debility plus delay, equals growing hopelessness. Debility plus delay equals a growing sense of hopelessness. That's why it's curious to us, this passage, because it seems as though when Mary and Martha tell Jesus, I mean, if, if we had heard the news, we'd jump in the car and we'd cry, go immediately to our friends, but, but Jesus seems okay delaying going to Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Uh, you see it in verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. Did you catch that? Jesus loves this family. And so when he hears that Lazarus is ill, that he's sick, he doesn't go. He waits two more days. <laughs> Why is that? I mean, we don't understand it. Why does Jesus delay? Of course, I do think we see here a truth I just simply 
mention that even the delays we experience in our lives, they're under God's sovereignty. Jesus loves us as his own, and sometimes he waits, sometimes he delays to act for reasons of of his own understanding, for his own glory, but still, Jesus delays, and, and the result for Mary and Martha and even Lazarus is, in fact, real loss. In fact, three times in John chapter 11, Martha, Mary, even the crowd will say, Jesus, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. Your delay led to the ultimate loss. And what would that be? Well, death. Death. Lazarus dies. And in fact, in this passage, even before Jesus arrives in Bethany, Jesus is very aware that Lazarus has died. Look at verse 11. After saying these things, he said to his disciples, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant he taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And then verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. All the grief and the sorrow and the sadness and the loss, it's present here with Lazarus's death because It appears from the passage and from elsewhere in the Gospels that Lazarus was the main provider for his sisters. So so when Lazarus is no longer there, Lazarus is dead, there is a real economic loss, a loss of protection in the ancient world. It It was some male who would provide for the women. Now that there was no male present, who would care for Mary and Martha? Who would provide for them? Lazarus' death meant a real economic, social loss. But of course, Lazarus is beloved, beloved by Jesus, beloved by his sisters. And so, so his death also means an emotional and relational loss. And even for Jesus, as he wrestles with all that has happened here, both to Lazarus, but also to his creating beings in general, he stands outside the grave and he weeps, angry tears, he weeps over the loss brought about by this death and death in general. And so in face of all of these losses, debility, delay, death, I ask you again, what do Jesus' words mean for us right now? When Jesus says, I am resurrection and life, what does that mean for us in the face of all these losses? What's the present value when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life? That is the centerpiece of this passage, the centerpiece of what Jesus says in his conversation with Martha. You, 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 you see her coming in the passage, in the section that we read with her losses, with her griefs and sorrows and her tears and her questions and her emptiness. And you hear it and what she says to him, verse 21, Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And in response to that, Jesus tells Martha, reminds Martha that her brother will rise again. And and Martha says, yes, I know that. She affirms what But many of the Jews believed that there would be a general resurrection at the end of the age. And at the end of the age, God's voice would shout, and all the dead would rise in that final assize, in that final judgment, and there would be a division in the world. She believes all that, and she affirms all that. And, And Jesus goes on in the face of her affirmation, and and doubles down, but he does so in a way that not only affirms what Martha believes, but but reorients it around himself, because he tells her, oh yes, God will will raise the dead on the last day, but but I will be Lazarus' resurrection and life. I will be 
the one who gives life. That part of what he says, isn't it? Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so most directly here, Jesus is affirming, yes, Lazarus has died. But not only will he have life on the last day, but Jesus is saying to her, I'm the one who will give him life. I am the one who will raise him from the dead because I am the resurrection and the life. And I will be that for him. Of course, we've heard this already in John's gospel, Jesus affirming that he is the one who will raise the dead. For example, John chapter 5, verse 21, for as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. Again, John chapter 6, verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. One more, John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so it is for those who believe in Jesus, for those who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, for those who put their trust in him, Jesus will raise them from the dead on the last day. Jesus will be our resurrection in life. Now listen, that is no small comfort. It is no small comfort as you wrestle with debility, with, with sickness and illness when you deal with delay, when you deal with death itself, it is no small comfort and hope to know that because you've put your trust in Jesus, though you die, you will live. He will raise you again. He will put your body and soul back together and collect all the dust from wherever it is and knit you back together in such a way that your body shall be whole. And all of the loved ones who've gone before us, who have put their trust in Jesus Christ, they too shall rise. Friends, this is a real solid hope to believe that Jesus says to us, I will be your resurrection in life. It means that justice shall finally come, that all the wrongs of this world shall finally be righted. It means that our, our value, or excuse me, our, our present labor has, has value and meaning. It means our deaths are not the end of the story. It means we will live forever. It's, this is a solid hope for you. Don't let it go by. Now, this morning, Jesus is presently here to remind you that you're not on a fool's errand in believing that though you die, you shall live. Jesus says, no, I will be your resurrection and I will be your life. And the, and the lines that Christians have affirmed and sung for, for years and years, they're true. Jesus lives and so shall I. Death, thy sting is gone forever. He who deigned for me to die, he lives the bands of death to sever. He shall raise me from the dead. Jesus is my hope and trust. And so when Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life, whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. When Jesus says, I will be your resurrection and life, that is no small thing. But notice, Jesus doesn't merely say, I will be. He actually says, I am the resurrection and the life. He's not just speaking here of a future resurrection. No, he's actually speaking of how our present lives are transformed by believing that in fact... He is the resurrection and the life. Look at verse 26. It's the rest of what he says. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Verse 26. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Again, I, I think here the NIV's rendering is helpful. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. In other words, I think what Jesus is promising us here and pointing us to here is the present value of his life, of his eternal life. 
Now, we've heard Jesus promise eternal life over and again through this gospel, most, most pre- preeminently in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, shall have eternal life. What does that mean? Well, e- eternal life is not simply life that goes on and on and on, although it's not less than that. Rather, when Jesus promises us eternal life, he means resurrection life experienced now. Life from the age to come experienced as a present reality. It's that life for which Paul longs in Philippians 3 when he says, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. It's that life that he describes in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 when he talks about the the surpassing power of God that raised Jesus from the dead and that same power is at work in you. You who are dead in trespasses and sins, he's made you alive, he's raised you up, he's already seated you in the heavenly places. That's not just some future reality, that is your present reality now. It's that life that that Paul describes in Colossians 1 when he speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory, the very resurrected Christ who enables us to toil and to struggle with his energy because the power of the resurrection is present. It's what the author Brennan Manning describes as, as the value of the present risenness of Christ. We live into this reality because Jesus says, I am right now for you, the resurrection and the life. And we live into that by believing in Jesus. Believing in Jesus isn't just simply so that you know in the end you'll be okay. Believing in Jesus means that this is life. This is, this is the life of the age to come in the present. And this is how we keep on living so that we will never die. Now, what does that mean in the midst of our debility? In the midst of the delays of this life and death itself, all the losses we experience, it means that this dark web of sin that's in this world as a result of the first sin of our, of our parents, who uh, sin comes in and holds us all in chain to bondage to decay. Friend, that cannot and will not ultimately undo you because Jesus is the resurrection and the life now in the present for you. And if you worry that your losses will cause your faith to fail, no, Jesus will hold you fast and sustain you. Why? Why why was what we talked about last time such good news that Jesus has grasped of us? Not just because his hands are nail pierced, but because of what we've already sung. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. That's why he won't lose you. That's why he won't let you go. It's because he says to you, not just I will be the resurrection and the light for you, but I am. Right now, I'm the Lord over life and death. It's interesting, though, after Jesus says these things to Martha and asks her, do you believe this? And she says, yes, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God who's coming into the world. What's the next thing that we hear Jesus say? What's the next thing we see Jesus do as the Lord over life and death? Well, he actually enters into sorrow. He enters into our sorrows. Did you see it? Did you notice this? After the previous section, Mary comes because the teacher is calling. We don't hear Jesus say that. And then in verse 32, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Here's the next thing Jesus says. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Friends, I think that's really important. That the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life for you right now in the present when you are knowing loss and grief and tears and you are being undone, he doesn't come to you in the midst of that and says, buck up. doesn't say that. He doesn't say, would you get your act together? The Lord of, of heaven and earth, the Lord over life and death, he comes and he weeps with us. 
and the tears that he weeps. Each tear is worth more than the greatest jewels this world has ever seen or known. And he weeps those tears with you. He weeps those tears with you. In the midst of all that you, you fear and know and all of your sorrow, he weeps with you. He carries your griefs. He bears your sorrows. And that's why we triumph over our sorrows and rise to bless him still. It's because the Lord of, of life and death with his sovereign power is there with us in our losses. Where have you laid him? Where are the losses? Where is the darkness? Where is the sorrow? Let me weep with you. But he doesn't just weep, does he? No, he actually does something about our tears and griefs and sorrows, the reason why we know those losses. He, he gives us a picture of, of what he's ultimately going to do here in the, in the final scene. He demonstrates his power over life and death. Verse 38, Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone laying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here's the Lord over life and death, the one who is resurrection and life, demonstrating that those losses that we know will ultimately come undone because he is the sovereign Lord over them. And we have a much greater picture of that, of course, at, on Easter Sunday, when the one who has the power, the keys of death in his hands, he remains under the power of death for three days. He descends to the grave, to hell itself, and he rises as a demonstration of his lordship over life and death. And that's why the Easter song we sang this morning, and our Easter affirmation, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, it's so important for us. Not, not simply when we're dying or when we come to our dying day. No, no, Christ is risen, he's risen indeed, is vital for our presence because what you are doing now, whether it's, it's the good callings God's given you or, or the losses that you are enduring, it all matters. It all matters. Your work and your marriage and, and your parenting and your singleness and your joys and your sorrow, it all matters. That's why we're able to, to stand firm because, because the, the one we've come to trust is the resurrection and the life. That's what Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. Therefore, my beloved brothers... Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Why is it not in vain? Why is our lives not in vain? These losses not in vain? Because Christ is risen. He is the resurrection and the life. And you can anchor your heart right there. As you know, loss, debility, and delay, even death itself. You can anchor your heart there because you have come to know and trust and adore the one who has said, oh, child, I am the resurrection and the life. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we do believe these things. We do. Help us in our unbelief. As the wind and the waves blow and we, we have our hands pried off of things that we cherish in our lives, we feel the losses so intensely and it feels as though the darkness will overwhelm us. Lord, in the midst of all of that, speak your word to our hearts and remind us again. Cause us to believe again that you who we've trusted, you are resurrection and you are life. Above all, Lord, may we leave this place knowing that you will keep our going out and our coming in. 
all the way to death's day and beyond. And grant us grace to sing the hallelujah. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.